My name is Frank Fukuyama. I'm the Mossbacher Director of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at the Freeman Spogli Institute. And I'd like to welcome you uh, to this panel on the midterm elections. You may wonder why FSI, which is devoted to international studies, is hosting a panel on an American election. Uh, the reason is that we have concluded that, uh, first of all, America is part of a larger trend towards populism that's taking place in many other countries around the world, but also what goes on in the United States really has a very big international effect, uh, and therefore we needed to uh, try to integrate uh, looking at the US with uh, that of other countries. So thank you very much for being here. I would like to thank Stanford and government and Stanford Women in Politics for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, we have uh, four uh, great speakers today. Uh, in order, they will be Doug Rivers, who is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, professor of political science at Stanford, and president and CEO uh, of YouGov Polymetrics. He'll be followed by Morris Fiorina, who's a senior fellow at Hoover and Wendt family professor of political science uh, at Stanford. Uh, his research is focused on polarization and representation. Uh, the third speaker will be Didi Kuo, who is a research scholar at uh, CDDRL, uh, my center. She manages the program on American democracy in comparative perspective. And the last speaker will be Nate Persilli. He's James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at the Stanford Law School and has been heavily involved in, uh, as a consultant to the Federal Elections Commission. Uh, he actually played some role in this election by uh, being a special master in the number of the redistricting uh, contests that have taken place uh, over the past few years. So with that, uh, I would like to invite uh, Doug to begin. Oh, and by the way, we, um, we're gonna have questions at about 12.45. There are gonna be people up and down the aisles that will have cards, so if you do have a question, Please write them down, give them to the people, and then they'll uh, bring them up to the front. Thank you. So what happened on Tuesday night? Um, at some level, it wasn't very surprising. There was an enormous amount of pre-election polling, and most people thought the Democrats would take the House and the Republicans would keep control of uh, the Senate. Um, this is uh, some polling we did for, um, at YouGov for CBS News. Um, we did 90,000 interviews spread across the U.S., and we predicted every congressional election, and we compared the results to the actuals, and there are very few that were off by more than seven or eight points. Um, so uh, the outcome, which we predicted in advance, would be um, 225 seats for the Democrats. Uh, we also did a high turnout scenario where the Democrats would uh, go up to 232 seats. It was a very high turnout scenario. Turnout was 40% higher uh, this year than it was in 2014. Um, a record, I think, uh, since 1966. It was the highest overall turnout rate. Um, if anything, uh, uh, our estimates were a little lower than other people. And uh, right now, the Democrats have about 225 seats, I believe, with 13 outstanding. So it looks like it's going to be probably um, 230, um, high end would be 235. Um, in the Senate, uh, Republicans actually did better than expected. Um, there were races in Indiana and Florida where uh, the polls, most of the polls at least, tended to show a narrow Democratic lead. Um, at the moment, uh, the Republicans have 51 seats. There's the Mississippi runoff, which is pretty much a gimme for the Republicans. Um, and there are two outstanding races, Florida and Arizona, um, which um, I would have to say Republicans are favored in those as well. So they could go as high as 54. Um, if you want to know what happened in the election, all you need to ask is, did someone approve or disapprove of the job that uh, Donald Trump was doing? 90% uh, of Trump approvers voted Republican. Uh, and if you look at uh, Trump disapprovers, about 90% uh, voted Democratic. Uh, the days of all politics is local, that incumbents are invulnerable, 
that's over. Uh, incumbents win now because their party is a majority in their districts, uh, not because of voting for the individual. Uh, if anything, Republicans proved in this election that you can nominate almost anyone in the right district and win. Uh, that included one convicted felon, two indicted congressmen, uh, and one dead pimp. So what's been happening with Trump approval and how did that play into this election? Um, if you look at Democrats, this is daily polling that we've done since the beginning of the Trump administration. The green line is, um, this is Democrats only, is strong disapproval of Trump. Uh, it started uh, rather high and has only gone higher. Actually, it looks like it may have ticked up a bit to around 80% uh, at the time of the election. Um, it, if you look at Republicans, um, there is actually some change over time. Uh, the blue line is strong approval of Trump, and the red line is somewhat approve of Trump. And what's happened, uh, and uh, particularly over uh, essentially the last three or four months, uh, has been that Republicans are strongly approving of Trump, that the Republican Party has become completely uh, the party of Trump. Um, another uh, measure that pollsters tend to use uh, to indicate sort of satisfaction or dissatisfaction with uh, what's going on is an old item uh, started by, the, uh, by Gallup in the 1950s, which asked people, do you think the country is headed in the right direction <laughs> or is seriously off on the wrong track? Um, the, uh, on the left, we have Democrats, and what you know, notice is um, uh, around 80 to 90 percent think that the country is seriously off on the wrong track. Uh, among Republicans, the blue line is uh, people who think the election, the country is headed in the right direction. That hit a low point around the time of Charlottesville for Republicans in uh, 2018 and has been rising since now to the point where overwhelming majority of Republicans think the country is headed in the right direction. Uh, despite the somewhat carnival atmosphere of the election campaign. Um, these are data that we've collected since uh, Labor Day, so the time axis is compressed, um, and it's a question of uh, are you more enthusiastic or less enthusiastic about voting in the midterm elections this year than usual? The blue line is more enthusiastic, uh, the red line is less enthusiastic, and yellow is about the same. And what you see is that at the start of the campaign, Democrats were higher than Republicans, um, you know, hovering around 60%, and Republicans were about 50%. So at the start of the campaign, this is before the Kavanaugh hearings, um, it appeared like Democrats would be in the unusual situation of having higher enthusiasm in the midterm elections, absolutely the reverse of what 2014 looked like. Um, but uh, Republicans uh, recovered, and if anything, were at higher levels of enthusiasm by the time the election came out. Uh, so whatever Trump was doing in the campaign did seem to energize the Republican base. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, the bases in uh, American politics. Um, the um, the usual way they're defined are in terms of demographics, and in particular, there are four gaps that are interesting. Uh, the one that's probably the most salient in American politics and has been forever uh, is race. Uh, and so you have these huge gaps between the voting rates of whites and non-whites, with um, non-whites, meaning uh, African Americans, Latinos, and Asians, um, running on the order of 30 to 40% uh, more democratic than whites. Uh, that's more or less stayed constant. Uh, there hasn't been a ton of difference. Um, another one that's been talked about uh, recently are uh, age gaps, that millennials, uh, at least in this election, voted overwhelmingly <coughs> democratic. Uh, so if you look at the difference between 18 to 29 year olds and people over 65, uh, there was a 19% gap uh, in favor of the Democrats among younger voters. Um, and that's uh, quite a bit larger than it was in 2014 or 2016, and certainly larger than it's historically been. That's a little deceptive because 
uh, minority groups are growing in terms of population faster than whites. Uh, the proportion of whites in the electorate is basically a time trend downward. Um, um, so when you want to look at these differences, you typically want to look at them among whites because um, whites are um, essentially the swing group uh, that if, if Democrats win whites or do well enough among whites, they'll uh, win the election, uh, but they've been doing rather poorly recently. Um, so among whites, you can look at the gender gap, and that's been relatively stable. It was um, 10 points in 2018. Uh, compared to nine points in 2014 and 12 points when you had a, a woman candidate uh, in 2016. That actually hasn't been changing much. Um, the one that has changed a lot in recent years is the education gap. So if you looked at Stanford graduates 50 years ago, they were probably overwhelmingly Republicans. I don't have any data on that. Um, but what's been happening of late is um, that uh, Democrats have been increasing their support among college-educated whites and Republicans among non-college-educated whites. Um, and uh, so we had a 16-point gap in both 2016 and 2018 between college and non-college graduates. Uh, so the Democratic Party is basically a party of minorities and well-educated whites and urban areas. Um, and then finally, um, the age difference in 2018 is still striking, even if you look among whites. Um, whether that'll hold is hard to predict, but the uh, long run effect there um, could be quite large. So I've described the demographic differences. Uh, what's interesting, and hopefully we'll get into it uh, in the Q&A and so forth, is what's motivating this? What's causing um, educated urban uh, whites uh, and minorities to vote Democratic, and rural, uh, lower education uh, whites to vote Republican. Um, and there are a whole host of issues um, that um, I think uh, Trump has been using to activate uh, that portion of the electorate. Uh, so the most recent of these was birthright citizenship uh, and the caravan. Uh, so this is some polling from this week on uh, the caravan. Um, so um, if you look at the issue, and we asked how serious a threat it is, and over half of Republicans thought it was an immediate serious threat of invasion uh, that apparently required uh, mobilization of thousands of uh, troops. Uh, and among Democrats, over half thought it was not a threat at all. Um, so. You know, this is a classic kind of uh, what used to be called a dog whistle issue before Trump turned it into a bullhorn issue. Um, and um, if you look at the politics of this, the interesting thing is the swing group and dependents are about evenly spread. Uh, that's not, in general, the kind of issue that you want to use to win an election because uh, you're going to, uh, if you take a stand on something like that, you're going to lose as many votes as you gain. Uh, and that gets us to the crux of the problem in recent elections, um, which is there's a choice between a base mobilization strategy where you use issues like this to fire up your base, or a persuasion strategy where you try to uh, convert swing voters. And what we saw Trump do in uh, 2018 uh, was essentially a base mobilization strategy. Uh, and it appears to have been somewhat successful in rescuing this election from being a disaster for the Republicans. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Mo? <laughs> on Sunday, I'm flying to Europe for my biennial attempt to explain what's going on in the United States. And uh, <laughs> one of the first things you have to do is to explain that we have a weird electoral system in many respects. We're electing the legislature independently of the executive. The legislature is bicameral, only one third of the Senate is elected. Wyoming has as many senators as California, et cetera, et cetera. And in this election, uh, this, the structural differences in the electoral system advantage the two parties differentially. Um, the Democrats uh, needed two for a majority in the Senate. Uh, from the day the last election occurred, it was unlikely to occur because they were defending most of the seats that were up. And uh, 10 of these seats were in Trump states, states carried by Trump in the last election. Contrast, only one Republican was in a Clinton state. 
On the other hand, in the House, the Democrats needed 23 to take the majority, and this was thought to be very likely. Uh, the average number of seats lost by the presidential party in the midterm since 1950 is 24. And here, uh, there were twice as many Republicans in seats won by Hillary Clinton as there were Democrats in seats won by Trump. So very different expectations. Political scientists have developed forecasting models over the years, and these are models based on the so-called fundamentals, uh, peace and war, uh, economic prosperity, presidential performance, uh, without any reference to the actual candidates or any uh, polling uh, data. And uh, these models for, uh, were published in the, uh, the current journal, one of our current journals. Uh, as I say, they use an economic variable like real disposable income, Trump's approval, uh, maybe the number of seats at risk, uh, things like that. And they were predicting anywhere in the order of 27 to 44 seats uh, in the House would go to the Democrats. Uh, most people don't try to do the Senate because there's so few cases, but one or two seats to the Republicans in the Senate. Uh, the journalists also are in this business. Uh, they cheat, though, because they actually ask people how they're going to vote. Uh, they're not just trying to predict on the basis of the fundamentals. Uh, no offense, Doug, here. Uh, Nate Silver, in 538, uh, gathers an incredible amount of data, tortures it unbelievably, uh, came up with 38-seat Democratic gains. Uh, Doug, as mentioned uh, in their polling, uh, came up with a smaller figure. Larry Sabato relies not only on polling data, but reports from real people in the field. And basically, uh, they came in in the same general range. So what happened? Um, the Democrats took uh, 35 seats in the House. That happens to be the exact average of the political science forecasting models. Uh, the Senate Republicans may be a little better than expected. Uh, governors uh, did well, but uh, a couple of disappointments in Ohio and, uh, and Georgia. And state legislatures, it'll be a while before we really know, but about 330 seats. And uh, in general, I was uh, happy with this outcome. If it had been a huge blue tsunami, um, that would have contradicted the political science models and it would suggest that campaigns and campaign spending really are more important, which political scientists tend to discount. Even more importantly, it would have contradicted the argument in my recent book, uh, Stable <laughs> Majorities. Um, but, um, by the way, with the holidays coming up, this would be a very thoughtful gift for your friends and relatives uh, as the season. Okay. And the, the subject of this book is the, uh, uh, the fact that we are living in an electorally very chaotic era. It's almost unprecedented. You have to go back to the end of Reconstruction to find a period like this, that essentially there are no majorities. Uh, neither party can get a hold of any institution to hang on to it. The presidential elections are close. We've had two elections where there was a split between the popular vote and the electoral vote. The House has been going back and forth. The Senate is up for grabs in almost every election. And as I say, this is, this is nearly unprecedented. We had a long Republican era to start the 20th century, and we had a Democratic era of the New Deal. We had an era of divided government at the end of the century, but the Republicans had the presidency, the Democrats had the Congress. It was just sort of like that, whereas this is just sort of chaos, as they say. Now, the, the standard uh, journalistic uh, explanation is that we are a 50-50 nation, uh, basically that uh, the country is divided evenly and there's a few people in the middle who are either undecided or clueless and they're switching around. Uh, all the political science research suggests that's not the case. The, the electorate in the large has not changed much in the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, this is the ideological self-classifications of the American public uh, since Jimmy Carter's days. You see back in 1976, uh, Carter is a born again Christian uh, he's running against an accidental president. It's about 20% liberal, a little over 20% conservative. It's basically the same Trump-Clinton. And in both years, about 40% of the people say they're moderate, about 40% of the people say they're moderate. You look at specific issues, it's the same sort of thing. Uh, this is abortion. Uh, should it be always illegal? The Republican position here, it's been about 20% forever. Always, uh, always legal, the Democratic position, it's gone up about 10 but basically sometimes, for some reasons, that's the modal position uh, around 50%. Of course, neither party offers uh, the electorate that position. And that's the key to what's been going on. What's happened in the United States is what we call party sorting, uh, which has led to party polarization. And that is, in, historically, uh, our parties have been big tents, and that's the case in, a, in all two-party systems. The Democrats were a left-of-center party with a moderate and a conservative wing. The Republicans, a right-of-center party with a liberal and moderate wing. And over time, through both replacement and uh, conversion, the parties have shed their minority wings. The Democrats no longer, Joe Manchin is a political dinosaur in the Democratic uh, Party, conservative. And I can't think of any Republican liberals. But earlier on, for example, all right, it's Republican liberals who provide the votes to break the Democratic filibuster and pass the 1964 Civil Rights Bill. 
It's the Democratic conservatives who provide uh, the votes to pass Reagan's tax cuts in 1981. We had this kind of cross-party um, um, bipartisanship or cross-party coalitions because we had more heterogeneous parties. Today, we don't. And that's, that's basically the upshot here. We still have a big middle in this country, but we have a, a I wouldn't say hard left, hard right, but we have parties that bracket the American public. And the general thing that happens, I'm vastly oversimplifying what's in the book, but the basic argument is we have a one-third, one-third, one-third electorate when you take it, um, turn that into account. When a party wins full control, as the Democrats did in, 19, in 2008 or the Republicans in 2016, they attempt to legislate the positions and the priorities of their base. These are, in general, not the positions and priorities of the American public. In 2008, if you look at the public opinion data, the public was not clamoring for cap and trade. They were not clamoring for health care, but the Democratic base wanted that. In 2016, the public was not clamoring for tax cuts. They were not clamoring for immigration restrictions, but that's what the Republican base wanted. So when you have the parties legislate the priorities and positions of their base, there are a lot of people in the middle who provided the marginal votes who, do, who leave you in the next election. And we get this ping-ponging pattern that we're currently engaged in. As far as the future, I think it's extremely hard to say. Uh, we're already seeing the extreme, uh, the intra-party debates. Uh, basically, in the Democratic Party, it's the progressives versus the pragmatists. Uh, do you impeach, uh, try to impeach uh, Trump or not, uh, for example? Uh, would you have done better in Florida and in, uh, in Georgia running uh, more fighter pilot type candidates like they did in the House or not? Uh, in the, in the uh, Republican Party, it's just a great uncertainty. A big blue tsunami, I think Trump would have been done, of course. Uh, a big, uh, if it held the, uh, the House, uh, then I think probably it would have been Trump's party clearly. As it is, it's something in the middle. And so I think it's very difficult to, uh, to say what lies ahead. So thank you. Uh, as far as policies, maybe nothing. And that may be good, or that may be bad, depending on what you think the Congress and the President would be likely to do. Thank you. <coughs> hey, Dee Dee. I don't have any slides, so I'll just stay here. Okay. Um, so I'll talk about three things today. First is the sort of new demographics of the House and Senate and the types of candidates that were elected, particularly from the Democratic Party. Then I'll say something about reform momentum, reforming our electoral institutions in particular, um, a lot of initiatives passed at the state level. And finally, I'll say something from a comparative perspective as someone who works on democratization, um, what the sort of current landscape is of liberal democracy in the United States, given the challenges posed by this current president. Um, so first, it's important to acknowledge, I think, that it was a really great night for different types of candidates, new types of candidates, to the, to the Congress. So 23 women won in the Senate. That's only one more woman than was already there, but 17 of them are Democrats, six are Republicans. 101 women, at least, in the House. There are still some races being counted. Um, 88 of them are Democrats, 13 are Republicans. And there are also more female governors, a big win in Michigan, uh, especially. Um, in the House, you have two Muslim women who were elected, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, and one of them is Somali-American, Ilhan Omar, and also two Native American women who were elected, one of whom from Kansas, Sharice Davids, is also gay. And you have Ayanna Presley, the first black woman elected from Massachusetts. I don't mean to just have a laundry list here, but there are a lot of interesting um, sort of ceilings that were broken last night. And also a, a big win, Abigail Spanberger defeated David Bratt in Virginia, who famously was a Tea Party candidate who defeated Eric Cantor a few years ago. One thing that I think is important to note about these trends is that this election upended a lot of the conventional wisdom about how people enter politics. Typically, women have a harder time fundraising. They also put in a lot more time in different kinds of offices before running for federal elections. And this year, a lot of women just said they didn't care about those things. They did a pretty effective job fundraising, even though overall male candidates still fundraised more. Um, but many of them didn't sort of wait their turn, quote unquote. And I think that there is a momentum that is very much on the side of the Democrats towards um, inclusion of new types of people into the party and into Congress. Um, the second thing to note is that there is an increasing recognition that a lot of the outcomes we have in terms of the partisan composition of Congress is a product of institutions. 
So there are some structural um, biases, and I don't mean that in a bad or malicious way, but there are just some ways that our electoral institutions, because they're based on geography or partisan election administration, tend to favor one party over the other. And you saw a lot of claims of anti-majoritarianism in the way the Senate and the House are constructed um, that is at least a sort of interesting thing to note, that there might be some momentum for reform. Uh, you also have Democrats who are saying, well, we have to mobilize many more voters and we have to win sort of large majorities in order to get uh, small majorities in each of these institutions, which is not really the case in other countries where you have proportional, some level of proportional representation where the aggregate vote share to the parties is reflected in the legislature. Finally, you have ongoing issues about redistricting and ballot access, which Nate will discuss more, but you have more independent redistricting commissions that were a product of ballot initiatives in states like Colorado, Michigan, Missouri, Utah, and Ohio, which passed earlier this year. So some citizens who are saying that they no longer want partisan redistricting, you had um, ranked choice voting that was adopted in Maine. It actually had been adopted, but then vetoed by the governor. There was a protracted court battle, and now it has again been decided on by the voters. And also more automatic voter registration. Um, we have early voting in more states this year. There were 37 states that adopted it than you have had in any previous election year. But you see more uh, momentum to make it easier for people to vote. Um, and typically, it's expansion of the electorate uh, favors Democrats. Um, but to zoom out a little bit, some things we haven't talked about are as soon as the election happened, um, a few things happened. There was a pretty bananas press conference where President Trump uh, continued his attacks on the media and like in a really interesting exchange yelled at Jim Acosta um, and told him he was a bad person. I mean, it wasn't necessarily anything he hasn't said before, but it was just an interesting sort of back to Trump as usual immediately after the election. And he also fired Jeff Sessions. So, you know, we have a president who, in terms of polarization of the parties, a lot of the Democrats who were elected to the House were very pragmatic. So their argument was basically, hey, remember the Affordable Care Act? We're gonna shore that up. You know, you have some retirement benefits, Social Security, Medicare, we're going to protect that. You seem to want some kind of common sense immigration policy or gun control, we'll try to do that. It wasn't anything that um, was far to the left of a typical Democratic Party platform. But one thing that's interesting is the Democrats are now the House majority and are being asked to immediately begin hearings investigating Russian interference in the election or investigating Trump's financial records. And I, whereas the Republicans who won election, particularly those that unseated some Democrats in the Senate, for example, are pretty on board with Trumpism. I don't really know what to call it, which he doesn't really represent your average or moderate Republican voter. He's sort of doing his own thing, but candidates who adopted his lines did well. I think that what that means for the parties is that you sort of have a party that is protecting not just its agenda, its policy agenda, the Democrats, but also protecting sort of general liberalism and democracy in the United States. Um, and I will just say that liberalism is just sort of the protection of individual rights, whereas democracy is a set of formal institutions that's probably not under threat, so I'm not trying to be hysterical. But I do think that it's interesting to think about sort of challenges to ballot access in the United States. We have voter ID laws in many states. There were, this was a huge issue in the Georgia race, my hometown, um, my home state, sorry, where um, Brian Kemp, who was also the partisan secretary of state, uh, purged some voters from the rolls in a race that he was himself in. Um, you have questions about the partiality of judicial institutions and about the ability of the press to maintain its work um, in a sort of hostile environment. So this is just a question for the Democrats of how to shore up a basic recommitment to liberalism or, or what that even means these days. Like, are these threats real? Are they things we should panic about or not? Um, but in general, we know that for democratic stability in places where democracy is not settled, uh, which is not the United States, but in those places, you typically need all parties to be on board with the basic rules of the game and procedures of elections. And these are things that in the United States sometimes still seem unsettled. All right, thank you. <laughs> Nate? So uh, I'll... I'll start off as a political scientist, uh, and then I'll end as a lawyer here. Uh, you can tell I'm the lawyer on the panel. I'm, I'm the one wearing a tie. Uh, and I'll, let me, so, so uh, the typical political scientist move is to say, oh, look, 
and and, and uh, we've already heard this, that uh, there's not much new here. Uh, this is predicted by the models, and I think that's right. Um, but there was a lot of unprecedented uh, activity and, and results um, if you look at this in a historical perspective. As, as Doug mentioned, the turnout was enormous. I mean, this is truly outstanding. I mean, outstanding, it, it, it's, it's remarkable. You have over 114 million people turned out for a midterm election. Uh, that was, in, take the last midterm election where it was 83 million people who, who turned out. That's you know, well over 40% or close to 40% uh, increase in turnout. I should say as someone who, and, and as compared to say 2010 where it was 91 million, right? So these are almost general election numbers that we saw in um, a midterm election. You might think, at, at Didi mentioned this sort of <coughs> conventional wisdom, all right, that huge turnout elections would have ne necessarily translated into say a democratic wave. Now we shouldn't forget that the Democrats probably won the popular vote in the House by close to seven or eight points. Uh, uh, so there was a, a substantial gap there, but it wasn't, um, it didn't translate uh, in the way that, that I think conventional wisdom um, wrongly uh, suggests. That's because there was, as Doug showed, some enthusiasm uh, on both sides. Let me, let me speak as a lawyer just for a second on, uh, it is quite popular to bash election administrators uh, in the run up to an election. Um, uh, people sort of alternate between bashing election administrators and bashing uh, Facebook. Uh, but here, I think um, they did an incredible job given the huge turnout that we had uh, in this election. Yes, there were long lines in certain places. There were malfun malfunctioning machines and the like. But, but uh, for the most part, the people on the ground, and I say this as I used to be the research director of the Presidential Commission on Election Administration, uh, these folks get very little love. So, so I wanted to throw some their way. Um, part of the reason that the election was administered in what I think is a relatively uh, functional way was um, huge increase in early voting. And so uh, it's, there's a big debate as to whether the availability of early voting actually increases turnout. For the most part, the consensus among political scientists is it doesn't make a huge difference. But from an election administrator's standpoint, if you're dealing with 114 million voters who are coming in in the midterm, you're able to uh, shuttle a lot of that flow into the early voting period. And so it's likely, you know, I, we don't know what the, what the final numbers are. Indeed, we've got millions of votes still outstanding. Um, uh, certainly hundreds of thousands of votes uh, still to be counted in California, maybe in the millions. And so we'll see. But, but I thought that was, that's something that's, that's gone unnoticed. So again, ju just in a historical perspective, this, this turnout was remarkable. Second, just in terms of the results, um, what happened yesterday or two days ago uh, has never happened before where you have a flip in the House and then the other party gains in the Senate. All right, at least since we've had popular elections of senators. All right, so that is quite remarkable. Uh, part of this goes to the anti-majoritarian character and, and, and the distortion that happens because of the selectivity of the Senate, and which seats are up and all that. But it's, you know, it's worth noting, um, and, it, and it, it, it speaks to the sorting uh, that Mo was talking about. Going, if you peel away from, from what the, the federal races that everybody has been talking about, looking at what happened down ballot, you see um, some of the, the, the typical well, sort of mini waves that you would see given the number of congressional seats that uh, have, uh, that were picked up. And so uh, the Democrats were able to flip about half a dozen um, uh, ch legislative chambers. Um, another unprecedented uh, feature of the results is that now every state legislature in the United States is unified by one party or another with the exception of Minnesota. So that every state legislature is either controlled, the House and the Senate and the state legislature is controlled by Democrats or Republicans, except for uh, Minnesota. Uh, but we then had some sort of counter trend governor elections in a lot of these states so that we now have 22 state governments that are run by Republicans in a unified way, 14 run by Democrats and 13 that are divided uh, as a result of these elections. Um, as Mo mentioned, the, the Democrats also picked up close to 300 state legislative seats uh, nationwide. You know, they got, uh, they, they lost so many during the Obama years that this is just sort of uh, uh, bringing some of it back. They also um, picked up four attorney generals uh, seats in, in Wisconsin, Colorado, um, I think Michigan and Nevada. Um, let me, let me end by talking a little bit about uh, gerrymandering since 
as Frank mentioned, uh, I've been personally involved in this, um, working for courts. Uh, a lot of commentators, when they talk about the effect of gerrymandering on the distortion the House of Representatives put, say, um, Republican advantage in the 20 to 30 seat range uh, nationally. Um, a lot of, when the, I've always been a little bit puzzled on how you come up with that number in part because um, it's as compared to what? Certainly that if the Democrats had control in the states that were gerrymandered uh, for Republicans, that there would have been many different outcomes both in this election and the last few elections. And so just to review, the 2010 election, this sort of Tea Party wave election, swept uh, uh, Republicans into so many state legislatures so that then they were able to control the line drawing in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, um, and Florida, and Texas, right? So that's a huge number of states, many of which are, are, are battlegrounds. Um, but the, the geographic sorting that occurs because of the overconcentration of Democrats in cities and, and um, uh, to some extent in, in suburbs uh, then has these uh, uh, distortive effects. You can see that in the Pennsylvania plan, uh, which despite the fact that it looks like, that you, you had a Republican uh, written plan that prior to this election had either depending on how you count, 13 to five, they had 18 seats in, in Pennsylvania, 13 were Republican, five were Democratic. Then Connor Lamb won his uh, seat outside of Pittsburgh. And so it was um, six, Democrat, six Democratic seats to, to 12 Republican seats. With the court-drawn plan, it ended up only being 9-9. Nine, nine. Uh, in part, that's because of how inefficiently uh, voters in Pennsylvania are, um, uh, Democratic voters are distributed in the population. There was a lot of, um, commentary that thought that this was going to be sort of a sweep in the other direction. Uh, but despite the fact that Democrats probably won 10 percentage points more of uh, the vote uh, for House seats in Pennsylvania, they still only got you know, roughly half of the state. Uh, I think I'll end there, and, and I've got, if we can talk about campaign finance and, and um, uh, any of these other election law uh, issues, but my bottom line is also similar to, to folks on this panel, which is that this is kind of a hardening of the polarization that we've uh, been seeing, a hardening of the sorting that, um, that, that Mo talked about, geographic, demographic, and the like. Uh, and if you were thinking that this would be a disruptive election uh, in teaching us some political lessons that we haven't been learning, um, then you were mistaken. And so that this is sort of indicating trends that are going to be uh, with us for a while. Okay, thank you. So I'd just like to remind everybody you can still ask questions uh, if you write them down on a card. We've got a number, but before we get there, I would like to ask a question of my own. So it seems to me uh, one thing that this election showed is that, uh, I mean, it's kind of reinforced uh, this observation that Jonathan Rodden has made, that the single thing that correlates most strongly with uh, either Republican or Democratic voting is population density, essentially. So even in red states, you know, the, the capital cities or the university towns all voted Democratic and, uh, and so forth. So demographically, that's not a great thing for the Republican Party uh, over time. Uh, also, uh, Doug, what you mentioned, the fact that young people are voting in substantially larger numbers for, for Democrats is also not a good thing because they're gonna get older uh, and there's gonna be more of them, which seems to then imply that you've got this real problem that the Republicans, if they wanna remain competitive, either have to stick with the strategy that Trump was using to get, just get the Republicans that are there fired up and voting in higher numbers, or they have to continue to rely on these non major well, these, these kind of anti majoritarian uh, strategies like, you know, discouraging Democratic voters from voting or gerrymandering or, you know, strategies like this, but that over time uh, it's going to get worse and worse. I mean, the, the imbalance between popular votes and electoral outcomes is going to increasingly be skewed. Uh, against the Democrats. So I, I know this is not a question, it's about the future, so you can't really answer it, but I'm wondering if anyone could speculate on how that's gonna play out, uh, whether these assumptions are correct and whether we're heading towards a kind of crisis of representation for these reasons. Well, one 
important thing that happened this year was the Florida felon voting referendum, which will add uh, nearly a million eligible voters in uh, Florida. Um, so I think the, you know, I tended to believe that the restrictions on voting and so forth were only important around the edges, but it's been embraced as a strategy by Republicans pretty aggressively. Um, I have to think it's a sign of weakness that when a party is saying uh, we want to prohibit people from voting, make it harder to vote, uh, that's an indication of uh, nervousness about their um, actual electoral strength. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's going to work out well in the long run for Republicans. What else? I'll just amplify something that, that Didi said before. If you look at the referenda, not only did you have the felon disenfranchisement um, anti-felon disfranchisement law passed in, in Florida, but you ended up having um, several of these other states that had passed either election day registration or um, uh, sort of easier registration. Um, at the same time, in Arkansas and North Carolina, they, they passed the voter ID law by, um, uh, by referendum. Uh, voter ID, which is actually quite popular among the American population, uh, but that you're seeing sort of these, this kind of schizophrenia when it comes to uh, election reform, depending on uh, which state you're looking at. I, I have to say, as a native Floridian, that um, the, so I wasn't actually surprised with the results in the Senate and the governor races there, but if you told me that felon disfranchisement would pass, the anti-felon disfranchisement referendum would pass with the margin that it did and those two folks would lose, that is sort of striking. And then just from a historical perspective, um, that you would have this, broad shift on the issue of, of felon disfranchisement over the last 15 years. I mean, one out of five or four, so African-American men in Florida cannot vote because of felony conviction before this law. I mean, it's a substantial um, barrier. Uh, how, it will, how it will affect politics and how many people will vote as a result, no one actually knows. It probably would be about, a, you know, make a difference if the elections are as close as they were in Florida this time. Um, but the, the shift in, um, opinion on this question of felon disfranchisement over a short period of time is really remarkable. I will also just say that Democrats made inroads in suburbs, which are typically pretty conservative areas, and partly because of the gap that Doug noted about education. So in highly educated, or in places where people have a college education, um, it's sort of a toss-up. Even if it's a suburb, it's becoming increasingly competitive for the Democrats, which is interesting. OK. Uh, so. Here's a question, did candidates who embrace Trump uh, win or lose their elections? Donald Trump thinks that they all lost, uh, they, they, they won if they embraced him, but he, he endorsed some candidates that actually lost to Democrats. Do you know what the net result of embracing Trump was? It's hard to say because he yeah. endorsed so many people who were never gonna lose. Uh, and so you can't, you know, I mean, ask Chris Kobach how well it worked out for him. I mean, uh, you know, so it, it really depends. Scott Walker, <laughs> who you might have thought had embraced Trump, but then I guess they, the love really wasn't there. Uh, he, he, of course, lost for governorship in uh, um, Wisconsin. And so, I mean, there's something to it that, that uh, you know, at the margins, he may have had a, a better effect, but, you know, I uh, get Ted Cruz certainly won, but obviously that was a close race. I think looking at what's happening in Texas is really interesting, by the way, not just at the um, state level, but what was happening down ballot, even in the sort of, even the judicial races, there was some shifting. Um, so I don't know if you can, we can say it. The other thing, and it, sorry to free associate here, is do you see the, the kind of, um, not just a Trump effect, but do you have a kind of Bernie Sanders effect on the other side? And I think as, as, Didi mentioned, I, you don't see that, that, that there were a lot of very establishment type Democrats, a lot of military veterans who were running, many of whom lost, uh, but, but there was, um, you, you can't say that the kind of uh, most sort of left of the Democratic Party was particularly uh, successful. So I don't, I don't think you can say the sort of Trump imprimatur was the decisive factor across the board, but it certainly helped some candidates. This is another example of the, what we call the endogeneity problem in all political science research, that you embrace Trump where you think it's gonna help you, right. and you don't embrace him where you think it's gonna hurt you. And the other major example of this is campaign finance. You know, people who have more money tend to win. Part of the reason they have more money is people give money think they're gonna win. And so uh, this problem is just all through questions like you're being asked about what, what makes, what causes what. That there's these mutually reinforcing cycles go back and forth. 
Well, I think it's important to note that in the Senate, so you have the exit of like Flake, Corker, um, McCain obviously has passed away. And so there is a contingent of senators who maybe were going to vote for Republican policies, but were very vocal about being against Trump and maybe because it was costless because they were leaving anyway. But Democrats who lost, like Heidi Heitkamp, um, Donnelly, Nelson, uh, McCaskill are being replaced by Republicans who are far less likely to speak out against Trump. So I think that that's just interesting to note in the Senate. Uh, so this is a question for you, Dee Dee. Um, it's a very long one, so I'm actually only going to read the beginning of it. Okay. You distinguish between liberalism and democracy. Can you define each? Uh, it appears that democracy is under greater threat than civil liberties. Uh, but maybe you could talk a little bit about the distinctions between those two. Sure. I, this is not where I expected the conversation to go today. But um, so th the reason I distinguish between them at all is because you have a new, among scholars of comparative politics, there's been a new model of sort of illiberal Democrats who have been elected. So this is people like Viktor Orban in Hungary, even Erdogan in Turkey, who came to power through traditional democratic means, but then once in power, use that power to um, consolidate. Uh, they're not you know, explicitly authoritarian, but they might go after university professors or opposition groups or certainly the press. So this is for sure a threat to liberalism, not being able to sort of practice uh, your basic political preferences every day. Um, but. I, it's a debatable question whether these countries are actively undemocratic. So liberalism, again, is just an, I, an idea. It's a theory about protection of individual rights, um, whereas democracy is a set of formal institutions that includes free and fair elections, but is also a lot of other things. I think the thing that is hard is that we realize now democracy is not just formal institutions, but a lot of informal norms, whether it's releasing your tax returns. Again, not, that's not a democracy question, but, but that was a norm. Um, or or if it's just a norm of protecting access to the ballot or a norm of having the media uh, be able to ask you questions and, and write things that are critical of you. Um, these are, are sort of new questions on the table in the United States about the extent to which they constitute a threat to our democratic system. And I don't think it's settled, and I, don't, I certainly don't feel qualified to say if Trump is a threat to either liberalism or democracy. I just posit that he makes us have to rethink um, what it is we're protecting at the end of the day. Uh, like, you may want a certain policy agenda, but you know, at, at a very basic level, what we want is protection of institutions um, that we've long taken for granted, I guess. And happy for anyone else to weigh in. Okay, uh, well, not surprisingly, Almost all of the questions are about what will happen in the future rather than what ha did happen in the election. So you're, again, going to be asked to speculate. But there's actually two very parallel ones, one about the Republican Party, uh, whether it will remain the party of Trump. And by that, I would say, you know, is this base mobilization using highly divisive you know, identity politics going to keep working uh, for the Republicans? How sustainable is that? Uh, and conversely, how do you think the Democrats are going to interpret the outcome of this election? And will this move them further left or you know, right or what? So the, the problem for the base strategy for Republicans is it seems to run into a ceiling in the low 40s uh, percent of the electorate, um, which makes it hard to win elections. Uh, the, um, I won't speculate on what the Democrats are going to do. I think everyone interprets elections that uh, you should do more of what they were uh, preferred in advance. I, I think partly what happens to the Republicans regarding Trump depends on what the Democrats do. Uh, we're going to have a whole slew of Democratic candidates running in the primaries. Uh, the role of superdelegates has been restricted. And Lord knows, I mean, I, I, it's hard to imagine uh, Trump wanting to run more against somebody like Kamala Harris or Cory Booker. Um, so, I mean, whether the Democrats sort of pick some middle of the road, non-scary type candidate or some highly progressive candidate, I think depends a lot on what the near term future for the Republicans. Mm -hmm. I'm already exhausted by the 2020 presidential election. 
Well, I think there's someone's going to challenge Trump as well on the, the Republican side. Yeah, someone will. I don't know if I think, I mean, having talked to some Republican consultants, they think that that's just, you know, an exercise in masochism uh, just because, you know, just put yourself out. Now, I, I think it's also possible Trump uh, decides late that he's had enough of this and he'll just declare victory and, and, and not run for reelection. But who knows? I mean, look, we, the big curveball in all this is what's the Mueller investigation going to show? What, what are these? All the, I mean, um, and it's very hard, you know, as Yogi Berra said, it's very hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, and so, you know, we don't really know. Um, how all these things are going to play out, but I, you know, I do see kind of fratricide on the Democratic side because they're they're usually good at it. Um, uh, but 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 what that means, you know, um, in terms of the types of personalities who will enter the race, and I don't know. Okay, Nate, this question is for you: uh, Redistricting post uh, 2020 census, are state nonpartisan redistricting commissions a good thing? Will more states uh, adopt such nonpartisan commissions? Basically, they need to hire law professors as experts to help them draw <laughs> lines. That that's turned out to be a you know, winning formula. Um, so there are commissions and there are commissions. This is like a long talk. And uh, students who are here, you can take my class on uh, uh, the law of democracy next term where we uh, talk about this. I'll be co-teaching with Ben Ginsburg. Ben Ginsburg was... Uh, uh, Council of Romney and George Bush, so uh, enroll now. Um, but so uh, it depends what the commission does. Uh, let, let me just talk about what the significance of yesterday's election is for redistricting 2020. The fact that the the Midwestern states flip their governors is very significant for redistricting. So Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin all have Democratic governors who will be there for the redistricting. And so they are in a position to um, veto any plans that they think are excessive gerrymanders. If they veto it, then it will likely fall to the courts. Uh, uh, and so that I was in that position uh, for New York this past time, as well as Connecticut, and then obviously with uh, Pennsylvania redrawing this past time. Um, the commissions, we don't know. I mean, commissions are curveballs because it's, it's not always clear how, it depends how they are constructed. I was a critic actually of the California commission when it was first impaneled 10 years ago or, or you know, a little less than 10 years ago. Um, but they actually did, a, I thought, a very sensible job in the end. Um, uh, Sometimes commissions are basically just outgrowths of the legislature that they uh, end up crafting, say, incumbent protecting gerrymanders because you have equal representation of Democrats and Republicans, and they, they just do that. Uh, so it really does depend on, on um, how they take their task and, and what, what they uh, see as, as the goal here. There's also, in Florida, there are some other laws that have been passed that, that constrict even the ability of legislatures to draw lines so that Florida has um, constitutional provisions that prevent excessive gerrymandering there. And so it, the, the long and the short of it is you can't just say one thing about commissions, except that we, they will probably not lead to the extreme partisan gerrymanders that we saw in uh, those states uh, and the, the last time around. Um, either they'll be more sort of incumbent protecting and proportional representation type situations, or they'll draw so-called nonpartisan plans that are um, reflective of political subdivision lines and compactness and those kinds of uh, values. All right, there's a question. What were the top two, three legislative issues that defined this election, and uh, how did the results affect those? So it seemed as if a ton of Democrats campaigned on health care, and uh, even though the Republicans haven't been successful in actively rolling back the Affordable Care Act, they've gutted it of um, some of its provisions and teeth, and so I think a lot of Democrats campaigned on, hey, pre-existing conditions shouldn't you know, deter you from being covered or shouldn't block you from being covered. A lot of basic provisions in the ACA that they said they would strengthen when they came to office. I'm actually eager to hear Doug on this. I don't see huge... I mean, I, what I'm interested in is whether uh, the rise in enthusiasm, to what extent you can tie any, any of the last two months in rise in enthusiasm specifically to the caravan issue and immigration. It sounded like you're pointing in that direction, as well as whether the Kavanaugh hearings had any um, uh, effect on that. I don't think it, you know, it switched votes so much as it may have uh, mobilized people. Can you 
Do you know? So the timing of the enthusiasm rise among Republicans seems to coincide with the Kavanaugh hearings and Trump uh, campaigning on immigration and being more outrageous than usual. Um, hard to say uh, exactly what caused what. Mm -hmm. um, the Democrats, uh, there, there was actually quite a good piece in the Times today on the Democratic strategy in the campaign, which was try to keep controversial issues off. Um, and so in particular, uh, Nancy Pelosi was pushed to uh, campaign on Planned Parenthood and she had a line that Planned Parenthood um, is in our DNA, but it's not in our talking points. That um, pre-existing <laughs> conditions were a much better issue for Democrats to the point where uh, some Republicans were trying to keep government out of your Obamacare. <laughs> I'll say, one of, if you look at the referendum votes, this is also really interesting, that you had Medicaid expansion on the ballot in ne Nebraska, Idaho, and Utah, and that, that passed, as well as minimum wage in Arkansas and Missouri, where it ended up uh, passing. Not I mean, so it's sort of contra what um, the statewide either governors or senator or, or uh, house races were showing. But this is actually still for, uh, uh, for you. So Trump, you know, uh, campaigned on the, the caravan and, and these identity issues. And he rejected this advice from Paul Ryan to focus on the tax cuts and the economy. So that's a risky strategy. You get your base mobilized, but then you lose potential suburban, you know, more educated votes. But does your polling data give you any insight as to if he had followed Ryan's advice and stuck to the economic issues, whether they would have ended up doing better? So the striking thing about the polling is how little change there was in people's preferences over the campaign or from 2016. So one of the things we do is we look at switches from 2016, and there was hardly any switching. What little of it was was in the Democratic direction. That is, people who voted for Trump, uh, typically in the upper Midwest, tended to come home to the Democrats uh, there was a big surge in turnout in 2016 in rural and suburban Midwestern uh, locations. And insofar as there was a swing, it was there. Democrats continued to vote Democratic. It was Republicans that lost votes. Um, but most of that, in terms of preferences, appeared to be fixed before the campaign started. So the only thing that changed over the campaign was the rate at which people were voting. Hey, Mo, do you have anything to add to that? Or? No, not really. I mean, I think the people were pretty much set in their, how they're going to vote, uh, and just a few people on the margins were affected by Trump. The, the other thing is, I mean, how much of the anti-Trump is his personal behavior, and how much is, is programmatic? Uh, that's the other uh, question. Yeah. Uh... As someone says, it's endogenous. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, the people who disagree with him don't like his behavior and vice versa. Um, one thing I would mention is, you know, political scientists uh, for ages said, you know, the economy determines the outcome of elections. You've got a good economy and you would expect uh, that to benefit Republicans. And I think Paul Ryan wanted to run a, mm -hmm. it's the economy stupid kind of campaign. Um, I think that actually, that advice may not be uh, as effective as it used to be. The thing that we've seen is uh, we're, people used to agree on the state of the economy. And if you look at the opinion data today, it's like <laughs> Democrats and Republicans live in different worlds. Uh, Republicans th think things are great, a uh, uh, booming economy, and Democrats uh, think it's terrible. Um, you know, that. To me, that suggests there's less room for economic voting and running campaigns essentially based on pocketbook issues. Um, okay, well, there's uh, actually a couple of questions about how the election will affect foreign policy. <laughs> Frank, why did you answer that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the only thing that you can say about that is if you look at Trump's foreign policy up to this point, he uh, has gotten more self-confidence. So in his first year, he had a lot of advisors that were fairly mainstream, like H.R. McMaster and, and James Mattis and, and so forth. Uh, 
but then in his second year, as he uh, seemed to get more confident about his own judgment and then decided that his own judgment was actually better than that of these advisors that were being pushed on him, he started pushing out you know, people like McMaster and replacing them with people who were you know, more extreme, less conventional, you know, people like John Bolton uh, and so forth. And so I'm assuming that you know, James Mattis is gonna be gone as Secretary of Defense. I mean, it wasn't quite as quick as Jeff Sessions, but it uh, doesn't affect Trump as personally. Uh, so I would think that would happen. And so basically, you're going to see a continuation of this turnover in, in personnel that is going to lead to you know, more and more rather odd uh, people being put in these rather you know, important positions. And what that's going to lead to you know, in terms of actual foreign policy uh, could be scary, uh, but we'll have to see. Uh, I mean, I think one, actually one of the biggest uh, issues that's gonna face them in the short run is how they deal with China, because that's actually the one area where there's a fair amount of consensus. Uh, it's not a highly partisan one, uh, and he's got this big choice of whether he continues to double down on the tariffs against China, uh, or whether he comes to a short-term deal like at the G20 you know, summit that's coming up where he's gonna meet with Xi. Xi. Uh, I would actually, my guess is that he's not gonna, he's not gonna have a short-term deal uh, and that uh, this China issue will continue to uh, be an important one for him and it actually could be a pretty important source of strength in the 2020 election because this is one issue where there really isn't much of a partisan divide that you know I think a lot of Democrats would like to see a much tougher policy towards China. So we'll have to see. All right, uh, one uh, I guess Final question is which, um, which party has been pushing us versus them uh, to uh, a greater uh, extent and what does that portend for the future of democratic politics in the United States? Well, that one's easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign slogan was stronger together and uh, uh, Trump is on carnage and, um, but it's, you know, it's a typical thing that you see across the world at the moment that the various populist uh, candidates run on uh, us versus them. It's kind of one of the defining characteristics of uh, populism and the, uh, you know, the Davos crowd is uh, one happy world together. It does, there is work, research showing that um, the partisan polarization that exists, so some of it is sorting, like Mo talked about, um, of just like sort of rightful factions into their rightful parties. So we have a conservative party and a liberal party in the United States today, whereas for a long time in the post-war period, we didn't. But increasingly, um, people map a lot of aspects of their social identity. So for example, they might take the fact that they're liberal, but also that they are women, that they are not white, um, and align it with their partisan identity. And this has had some troubling consequences. An off-cited statistic by Shanto Iyengar, who's a professor of communications here, is that people would used to have a problem with their children marrying outside their race or religion, and today they're fine with that, but like over 80% of Americans say they don't want their children to marry someone of the opposite party. So partisanship has become this new dividing line, and there 20%. are- 20%. Is it 20? Or 20 percent, yeah. Oh, he says, yeah. he says a higher 20 percent. 20 to 25, yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, no. take it up with Shanto. And, and it's but, also um, the bear there. Yeah, but it's, it's also <laughs> the case that 25 percent of Americans don't want, if they're Yankee fans, don't want their kid to marry a Red Sox fan and vice versa. Well, that makes sense. So just sort of, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you shouldn't have a yeah. mixed household on baseball. <laughs> yeah. um, but the, the problem with it is that people then engage in motivated reasoning, which Doug alluded to earlier, that you increasingly will perceive facts that are favorable to your side and not. And in broader trends of sort of new digitization of information, new forms of media, residential segregation, which is arguably on the rise. But I mean, the fact of this urban rural divide, you're very unlikely to encounter people who are very different from you or different who have different political values than you do. These trends make it 
easier, and again, it's an empirical question of how much they've changed over time, but they potentially make it easier for people not to have to really engage with people who think differently than them. Um, and that is not great for bipartisan compromise type things. Okay, we have two questions that are for Nate. Um, do you have any sense of how much uh, interference there was by foreign governments in this election? And then what role does voting machine insecurities play in recent elections? So um, I mentioned before uh, 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 that people alternate between blaming election administrators and blaming Facebook. Uh, and I think both institutions probably did, did well. I, I've told the people at Facebook that they have to realize that they're basically Palm Beach County these days, right? <laughs> that you know, if something goes wrong, everyone's going to blame them. But if something goes right, they're going to get no credit. Uh, and so, you know, there was a lot of hype about what Facebook and and others in Silicon Valley had done in order to try to uh, prevent the kind of foreign meddling that that existed in 2016. I um, I don't see any. Sig I mean, you, there was plenty of it out there, right? Uh, uh, you. you you know, the internet is huge. You can find millions of examples of anything. Um, but that it doesn't look like there was um, a whole lot of foreign meddling. You, you've got plenty of, you know, consistent divisive messages that are being sent uh, um, by, say, Russian accounts and the like. Um, but it doesn't surprise me that there wouldn't have been a huge amount of, of foreign sort of meddling. I think what probably was happening that we don't really know is um, testing of methods in the, in the midterms that then will be uh, professionalized in the general election two years from now. One thing, it, just to, to give you a, a frame to think about this through, is that the, um, the ability to identify foreign meddling uh, has gone down at these firms, uh, so that if you look, Facebook was, was pretty well able uh, two years ago to say, all right, these are Russian accounts, this is what happened, and you saw what happened with the Mueller investigation and the indictments where they, they even knew the people at the computers. Um, if you look at the accounts that Facebook took down over the summer, um, and then they've done some recently, they talk about, you know, these all have the signatures of Russian-style disinformation campaigns or Russian-style accounts, but they can't tell anymore. Um, there, there's, because it's becoming very difficult to distinguish domestic actors from foreign actors. And, you know, they've, the foreign actors have learned and, and have adapted to the kind of uh, uh, strategies that the, the platforms have put in place. On the question of voting machines, um, there's, you know, Georgia is, is now becoming the perennial bad actor here. Uh, not just in the machines, but in, obviously, for the reasons that uh, Didi was talking about. And so since they don't have a paper trail, um, uh, that's a pretty big problem. And there's about a dozen states that, that fit into that right now. Um, I was on the National Academy of Sciences panel dealing with the future of voting technology. And we have a whole set of, of recommendations on uh, this. Uh, you could be the only one who reads that report if you if you pick it up on the web. Uh, or you could wait for the movie. Uh, but, but, but it's... Um, uh, so I don't, I don't see uh, evidence of uh, tampering uh, with the machines. Um, maybe that's because people were really good at doing so. Uh, but, but the people who, who work in this area, um, I don't think so, saw a whole lot of it. But if you were looking for places to worry about, Georgia would be one of those, as well as a few other states that don't have uh, paper backups. And audits. One of the big recommendations of our of our committee was that you have to have post-election audits to make sure that we know these machines are working well. Okay, just two one, last. Oh, yeah, you wanna... just, just a one comforting thought is that uh, regarding Facebook and Russian interference and so forth is just that most people involved in politics vastly overestimate the extent to which ordinary Americans pay any attention to yeah. politics yeah. or news. The, the problem, and we have economists here studying like. Uh, I forget his name, and, and the problem is not fake news, it's no news. That basically, uh, you know, I, I don't think many political scientists lose much sleep at night worrying about uh, millions and millions of Americans being taken in by Russian interference or Russian uh, sites on Facebook or any other social media. Yeah, apparently the number one thing on Facebook is still lunch, like what people are eating for lunch, and the number two thing is breakfast. And news content is like less than 5%, so. Okay, last two questions. What do we know about the impact of the college vote by which I would interpret, what do we know about turnout among college-age voters? 
Yeah, so turnout is much higher among college voters and even higher among people with a postgraduate degree. Uh, another little known fact is that uh, turnout among college students is unusually high. They're easy to mobilize, they interact with each other and so forth. Uh, the turnout problem by age is largely people who recently graduated from college or didn't go to college who have other things more pressing than voting and doing politics. Okay, the final question I think is actually a pretty easy one. Uh, what do the results uh, of the election represent uh, for more bipartisan uh, cooperation between the two parties or greater polarization? We did have a president yesterday that said he was declaring war or going on a wartime footing with the House Democrats, but I don't know if any of you, any of the panelists have any observations about that? Well, let me just say something, uh, amplified what Didi said also, which is that there are, um, you have to also look at the Republicans who retired, right? And you have to look at the share of the House uh, Republican Conference, which is now the Freedom Caucus, which has increased uh, as a result of uh, the election. So um, the, you know, there's certainly no evidence of bipartisan uh, compromise on the horizon um, when, when they talk about something like infrastructure as, as one possibility, you know, I don't see how a bill like that uh, gets done, especially if, as there will be, you know, investigations uh, running amok. I mean, I think the Democrats are really trying to s struggle right now with what's the right strategy, how much investigating should go on. I mean, you've got all these aspiring chairs of uh, House committees now who feel like, you know, the old saying, they, they feel like, you know, mosquitoes in a nudist colony. It's, the question is where to begin. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, they're all gonna be uh, trying to, to investigate. And it's not just the Russia stuff, you're talking about HHS and EPA and, and um, uh, Department of Commerce, right? There's just so much that uh, if you wanna make a name for yourself, you've got an opportunity to do so. Um, there, oh, go ahead, Mel. Go ahead, no, go ahead. Um, there's a, so even though there's a political science question of whether or not campaigns matter, it's notable that a lot of the Democrats who won campaigned on some aspect of clean government or, or rational government. I mean, they didn't say that they would impeach Trump, but they did say we need to restore some kind of sanity and oversight in Congress. Um, and it's also worth noting against this backdrop of polarization that more and more Americans are very turned off by polarization and partisanship. So a plurality of Americans now identify as independents. Yes, they're leaners. A lot of them um, very consistently vote for one party or the other. But uh, against this backdrop of sort of gridlock and hostility and antipathy between the parties that we've seen for the past 20 years, you also have a large share of Americans who are quite fed up with it. I think uh, what tr Trump does will depend on what he thinks is his best path to reelection. That if in fact he thinks that uh, a few legislative accomplishments will make people go into 2020 thinking, gee, divided government's not bad at all. Uh, that's one possibility, or he decides to double down on the base strategy. I think it's, he's been all over the map on most issues in his lifetime. And so nothing would really surprise me if he has to make a cold, accurate calculation about how best to get reelected. Yeah, somehow, I think he just loves going to these rallies of his fanatical supporters, and he'd turn off all of these people if he actually did something bipartisan like going for infrastructure. So I just somehow don't see that really happening. I don't know, infrastructure creates a lot of jobs for those kind of people who go to those rallies, you know. Well, we'll see. <laughs> All right, join me in thanking the panel for a really great discussion.